Hey everybody, I'm Nico. And that makes me Kevo. And that makes this MCU.html backslash Loki's 5 and 6, two Loki's making out. Well, it's not really making, two, two Loki's kind of like smoosh face. It's confusing. It's weird. I don't like it, but I, you know, yeah, get it away. Get it away. We're here to talk about Loki episodes 5 and 6. Now that's Journey into Mystery and for all time, always. And these two episodes were in a lot of ways a bit more faster paced than the previous stuff. You know what I mean? Yes. And, you know, we were in a position where we were hoping for certain things, right? Like, I know I came into Loki looking for Kid Loki. Mm -hmm. And I know I came into Loki looking for some gay. And I don't think I really got either in the way I expected. But I sure liked the Kid Loki that I got. So I guess yeah. let's jump into Kate Heron and Tom Kaufman's episode five. Five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, Patty. I would have loved 12 episodes. I think that's something that this series really would have benefited from. It got that second season already. Yeah, but I feel like a slightly longer season one might have felt a little less slow, might have made the characters feel a little more developed, and might have more fulfilled the promise of what I think Loki had been described as in the first place. Episode five, I think, came the closest to what the promise of Loki had been in terms of all the Lokis we met, all the crazy void stuff. And, you know, it opened with Sylvie and Ren slayer yeah and that was a really bold choice after the prunification yeah and even with the um mid credits thing that was still a really interesting choice to open up with the back in the tva stuff instead of loki because again she's still a loki so it's still following a loki narrative as long as we are with one of them and you know this is moments from where we kind of drop renslayer in a lot of ways i understand that yes. she is in a lot of five and a lot of six but her performance in five and six feels very ancillary okay it, reactionary yeah mm -hmm. it doesn't really have the punch of what loki's up to of what sylvie's up to of what not Kang is up to in later episodes. We get some uh, great Morbius. We get some excellent work from B, who I hope gets her own IRL name. I'd be real excited yeah, for her. I would love to see more of her. Until then, I'm calling her B. Like yeah, B E A. Like that's her real name. Yeah, I'm just running with it. And She's very much a character that I said in early episodes I was having a reaction to, but I was really hopeful that they would bring her character to some amazing places, and they did. I feel really? like the actress' performance and the characterization that they gave her, the development that they gave her in so few episodes, really really made me feel a lot better about the early stuff. And it also helped to balance out some of my concern about the narrative. One of the things that I have been troubled by is the number of female villains in the Disney Plus lineup. I know that ultimately there was a terrible misuse of the gorgeous Josh Stamberg. I don't know why you wouldn't have him cast as my boyfriend in everything, but he made a great bad guy back in the, I almost said pages, the minutes of... Uh, WandaVision. I felt that true. We were ultimately meant to be like, no, no, no! You're bad, John Walker! I need a prop if you're gonna keep waving that thing. I'll take a little one. Speaking of caps, I feel like, you know, we were ultimately meant to be like, no, no, John Walker, you're, you're a bad dude. You sampled all the chocolates and put them back half-eaten. Right? Like, we don't like you. It did really, though, fall to Agatha, and in many ways, Wanda. It did really fall to poorly constructed liberal metaphor, Flag Smasher. It does ultimately kind of feel like Renslayer and Sylvie both play some really dark role in this production all said and done when the curtain finally draws on a scary new multiverse. So seeing B-15 become so much more by virtue of her strength, her ability, and her ability to adapt, that was one of the things that so many of the characters in Loki were incapable of doing. They were incapable of adapting to new situations. The only people who truly thrived during the course of Loki were the people who were able to adapt. Now that's going to be Mobius, it's going to be B-15, and that's going to be our Loki. Well, our, sort of Loki. He's kind of our Loki. The Loki that we got yeah, in Avengers. He's our Loki now. He's, he's our, our Loki, Loki now. now. High key our Loki. The people who couldn't adapt are the ones who ultimately orchestrated their own failures. So that's Renslayer, that's Sylvie, and that's most of the Lokis. Mm -hmm. While true, I can barely talk about one of the Lokis. <laughs> such a great performance. I did feel like even he was felled 
because of his inability to adapt. Now, his inability to adapt saved the day, but old man Loki, classic he sacrificed Loki, himself still, yeah. sacrificed himself because all he knew how to do was play games too big for himself. So he lacked adaptability, and that did lead to his downfall in a beautiful way. But I'm talking too much about B-15 through so many other people, and we haven't even touched on the fact that there was Alligator Loki, Kid Loki, Old Man Loki, and I'm really ultimately disappointed with what Boastful Loki came to, but yeah, we'll get to that. I think something interesting about all the points you're making is of this season of the TV show Loki, really the only character that you can definitively say almost the only one of the entire season who wasn't a villain at one time or another was Loki. Our Loki. Yeah. 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 He, he is burdened with glorious purpose. He was a little bitey at first when oh, he yeah. was working for the TVA, but he didn't have super malicious intent even back then. And by the end, he's almost virtuous. Whereas every other character except maybe Mobius, but you know, everybody loves a guy on a jet ski. Yeah, and Owen Wilson gives a really sort of thoughtfully un-Owen Wilson performance here. I feel like one of the things we characterize Owen Wilson with is being the cool guy who can't grow up and moves his face weird because he's had his nose broken. And I feel like that's what we're supposed to like take from most Owen Wilson performances. But this performance retained the subtlety of a man at the end of his journey throughout. There is a quiet sadness to Mobius that sort of in a Shakespearean Falstaffian way tells you the ending before you're even there. You know Mobius has to move on. His story is about his next step. And we recognize that in the fact that, I mean, number one, his name is Mobius and we have the Mobius strip. And so it, it's infinite. It, it, it goes on forever. And so his character idea should be clearly one that has no end. He just continues to evolve. And I really thought that that was one of my favorite things. He doesn't have too much in the finale. So it's kind of like, you know, five is sort of our last chance to really talk about him. He has some great moments with Sylvie, who as much as he loves our Loki, he did not care for Sylvie at first. So it's really cool to see him have had those nice moments. I love when he tells her she's his favorite. That was so cute. I love the three of their friendship. I would love to see more of the character in season two, but I would really understand if we never see Mobius again it's not his show uh for as much as we enjoyed him as a character wasn't he pretty short-lived in the comics yeah and, and that doesn't mean anything for the mcu no. it doesn't have to because one of the things we've been talking about a lot on this series partner show x's for podcast is that valkyrie was brunhilda and she was this big blonde busty valkyrie and she looked like she was going to break out into wagner at any moment right Love it. and then over time that sort of evolved and evolved and evolved and jane foster who is about to be the star of thor love and thunder became valkyrie but in the course of that, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie so overtook comics with a reinvention of a character through an incredibly talented, creative, and truly stunning actor. We love you, Jackie. We just love you so much, Jackie. You were one of Veronica's best friends. So they've ultimately created two Valkyries now. Jane is Valkyrie and Runa, a Valkyrie based on Tessa Thompson, are opposite ends of time Valkyries. Runa is one of the very first Valkyries who served under Bor Borison, while Jane is the first of the new Valkyries under Thor and Odin. And she evidently is the first person to ever wield my precious Yarnborn, which I don't have a oh. Yarnborn, so we're just going to keep wielding Stormbreaker because yeah. it's close enough. But yeah, so, you know, when we talk about the way that Mobius didn't have a whole lot in the comics, but that shouldn't halt his iteration in the TV shows from being more dynamic... I really agree because in so many ways, Kang being a Loki villain mm -hmm. and Loki standing in for both Thor and the Fantastic Four, the presence of that is so important to the further evolution of the MCU. And on that same note, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but one of the fun facts that I read about the finale when B-15 is taking the TVA officers to Renslayer's human main timeline office to show that she's a variant, the name on the diploma in the back is Rebecca Torminette, which was apparently a alias 
that Renslayer lived under in the comics. But if she's that woman in the first place, then it's already a different character than Renslayer is in the comics in so many ways. But they're trying to still pay tribute to who the character was, but expanding on it. That's the whole point of this franchise, is not to be locked into what the comics are exactly, but to build on them and use them as source material. It's something that we were talking about on the Doctor Who podcast that I appear on, The Traveling TARDIS, when we were discussing the outgoing showrunner Chris Chibnall and his difficulty using Doctor Who canon and instead preferring to invent all new aliens. And it has a lot of fans upset, most specifically because there is so much history that hasn't been touched in over 50 years that you can build from. You know, it doesn't always have to be Daleks and Cybermen. It doesn't even always have to be Silurians who aren't as well known as the Daleks and Cybermen. There's still like dozens and dozens of other aliens they could be drawing in instead of coming up with random stuff. And that's something that the MCU has been able to do so well, is come up with original storylines built off of all of the foundation that the comics have provided. And it's that sort of ability to take something that exists and rework it that I think works so well for this show. Eliath doesn't really belong to Loki, but he's a giant wolf. Loki is a wolf. And what is Loki the lord of? He's the lord of lies. The thing he goes up against at the end is a lie oath. And like, I really really love that sort of wordplay and one of the reasons that I am gutted when we find out that boastful Loki who was fucking hot was not a good guy was okay so now it's all the women and the one man of color in this show and then he who remains is also a person of color and Ravana Renslayer is also a person of color the I, optics are bad man it's just starting to get really dicey and by that same token I really want to discuss the gender and sexuality things that they did this season of Loki that feels like they were driving towards an attempt at diversity and inclusion, but really fell flat repeatedly, making Loki's paperwork at the beginning say that he is gender fluid, when ultimately he is stunned that there is a female variant of him, and we never meet any other female variant of him, even though there's like 12 in episode 5, and the fact that they make that so special means that the character is not genuinely gender fluid. The ability to shapeshift your genitals to whatever you want isn't what makes you gender fluid. And it really shows a lack of understanding of the subject matter from the showrunners, especially when they repeatedly keep being like, isn't this great? Isn't this great? It's, it's not fantastic. And we spent a lifetime being told, but I mean... We tried. And close enough. No, close enough isn't good enough anymore. I need queer visibility, not visible characters who are queer. And I need gender fluid visibility, not visible characters who could be gender fluid. I'm not saying we need to talk about the gender fluidity every episode. I'm not saying you need to do five minutes on Loki and whether Loki feels male or female today. But to actually make a point in Valkyries, again, to bring up the comic tie-ins, there is a child of Loki named Moore, and Moore is gender fluid and goes by them and they and looks an awful lot like a wet dog version of Tom Hiddleston. But it's important to note that it's almost like Jason Aaron, who is responsible for so much of what people borrow from for Thor and Loki. Jason Aaron and his current co-writer, Torn Grunbuck, said, no, this is gender fluidity, bro. This is what it's at. And then, you know, they just threw their sacks over their shoulders and walked back into the mountains. And it just feels like the creators are just making excuses for why these things are so questionable and you really can't make excuses. That really undoes any of the goodwill that you frankly didn't properly earn in the first place. Not to keep harping on it, but we must because it really did detract from our enjoyment of this season all of the Loki Sylvie stuff. It's so weird. You barely confirmed any sort of bisexuality with either character and the fact that the showrunners keep saying we didn't even think about that we didn't think about we didn't think self-cessed or anything like that we didn't think that was weird it really speaks to me of how much straight cisgender non-queer creators don't have to think about the potential controversy of their stories 
values. And it's something that I, being a queer creator, can't help thinking about at all times because we are already under scrutiny just for who we are. Even if we were telling a straight story, we would be under scrutiny just as queer creators. So we're already in our heads thinking about it and probably might have come to the conclusion of, a character saying they are bisexual, but then only ever having romantic feelings for a female version of themselves. Are we sure that looks great? But I don't even think they were thinking about it. But at the end of the day, it still feels like they are more willing to give us romances where someone has an affair with a figment of their memories and where someone is in love with a female version of themselves than give us actual queer visibility or inclusion. It's unfortunate. And I'm so glad you bring up the multiple versions and perhaps things they didn't think about. Because like we said, we find it a little problematic that boastful Loki is ultimately the Loki who betrays them and he's the only significant Loki of color, which is not attractive. Kid Loki is such a beloved thing and the kid did such a great job, but this kid Loki wasn't exactly my kid Loki. He was a little bit angry and murderous, and that's just not my shit. And much like Eli in Falcon and Winter Soldier, I really hope this isn't the only opportunity we will have had to see Kid Loki. If, if it's not, then okay, this was fine. fine. But if it's the only Kid Loki we ever get, that's kind of a waste of a really, really, really great and beloved character and the actor was great so i would yeah. like him to play another version of the same kid loki sure. that's maybe a little less grimdark for no reason now we did have classic loki and classic loki's self-sacrifice is such a beautiful touching tribute to another writer who maybe doesn't get as much attention for their thor kieran gillen wrote kid loki in its entirety but he also wrote some really important issues of thor including siege loki where loki basically kills himself for his sins and does it to save Thor and like it's a big deal and it's a really great story and I really love it yeah truly classic Loki self-sacrifice I mean I was literally sitting on the bed ugly crying holding my pillow I was just like he's doing it he's saving people the way he was always meant to and I just I love it so much and the defeat of Elioth was fine for me it felt a little easy it felt a little just oh it happened but okay I know you needed to get to episode six of six and yeah. Once we found ourselves in episode six, I was very happy, but it did feel like episodes one through two were one movie. Okay. Three through five was another movie. And six is an unrelated creature with minutes of the earlier things peppered throughout. Six almost felt like a sixth movie after six other movies, but in a way where I was like, this really doesn't feel like what the rest of the season was building toward. I felt like the season was building toward episode five. The Lokis working together, casting out their evil brother, Loki and Sylvie developing a plan, Renslayer making her final decision about what she's ultimately going to do, B-15 accepting her role in the New Order, Mobius reactivating within the TVA. Everything we needed from the show was solved in five. But the setup of the multiverse was born in six. That's anthema to everything that we've had in Marvel so far. We've been told in Marvel that the payoff is till the last fucking second. And then, you know, there's the after credit scene that, that fills you in. This was an after episode. This was like, okay. This was like the epilogue to Endgame, where you just kept being like, look, it's all moving and I love all of it, but it's just never going to end. I, I felt like this episode kind of came out of nowhere. It's hard to talk about the state of Disney Plus television without like clearing the desk and saying that Jonathan Majors gave a performance so unlike anything. Because like, and, and you know, I love her, but Agatha was really kind of pretty in line with what we know of the actress and with other roles we've seen her in. And what we thought we were probably expecting with the casting of Catherine Hahn. Truly. And the format that they had both described and as it was unfolding throughout the season. It was a marvelous finale but i don't think that there was anything unexpected from wandavision's finale True. whereas this loki finale one of the writers eric martin i believe described how he who remains was always an element of this from the very beginning but they weren't sure how much they were going to be able to get away with or what people were going to be expecting and when it got to the finale and 
most people were saying at most, like we did, they thought Kang would probably just be in a credit sequence or in the last five minutes. How much of this episode he was in and the fact that they were able to keep it secret was such a thrill for them. And it was really a thrill for us too. Part of why we didn't respond to episode five right away was because- It's gonna be Kang. We would have just spent the entire episode saying it's It's going to be be Kang. Kang. If it's not Kang, I hate everything. And we even saying that, would have just expected it was going to be Kang in the last few minutes of the finale. If we had spent an entire episode of this show saying it's going to be Kang, to have so much of the finale be he who remains, it definitely would have felt super redundant. And all of that seeding in episode five really, really, really is all the more justified with his involvement in this episode. I did have a couple of issues with just little things. Yeah. About it. He knows everything up until that moment. And I've seen a few people be like, well, if he knew that moment was coming, someone as all powerful as he who remains would have been way more panicked. Why? Why would he have been way more panicked? When was the last time you were immortal? But he is a presentation of mania. He is a presentation of multitude. Why would he react how you expect him to? I think... Part of the exquisite delicacy that went into creating this sequence is it's just the three of them for so much of this sequence. And evidently Jonathan Majors was told to just have a good time. Yeah, a lot of his weird stuff like jumping on the desk was improv. But then think about how Sylvie and Loki don't react beyond a slight flinch. I don't really know Sophia DiMartino particularly well, but this was such a cast of titans. These three playing against each other had just such a heavy reverberation. I was really grateful that, you know, they kind of blame it on other Kangs. It's just sort of like all the Kangs suck. Yeah. All Kangs are bad. I I like that, that we're not like dealing with the Kang who caused it all. You know, we're dealing with, it's just all the Kangs. They're just all garbage. There were several bad apples. And I think that's something that was part of this season and why we had episode five, where we saw there's a lot of bad apple Lokis, but we saw through ultimately kid Loki and classic Loki that some of them do have good in them as well. Everyone is a mix. And yeah, it's not just one Kang. There were probably And I feel like there were a few certainties that I was upset with with this episode. But good upset? So, like, my favorite comic book run of all time is New X-Men by Grant Morrison. Because there comes a point that literally makes your skin crawl. And you have to fucking hate everything you just read. And it's the most beautiful line of dialogue I've ever read. Really, Charles, a mutant with a star for a brain. Like, it's so fucking good. And it's in that moment that all of your worst fears are true. And the thing you didn't want to believe was slowly building for 15 or 20 issues was here. And it's lost. But it's almost a fulfilling loss. It's like the snappening. We're like, oh my god, you killed all those heroes and people and and even villains. But like, you promised me it would be big. And now it's big. Yeah, I really didn't want them to kiss and then they kissed and I really didn't want her to kill the one who remains and then she did. We knew she had to. It goes back to the thing we were discussing where why are all the villains of phase four female mostly so far? It's weird. It's just weird. Um, I will feel differently once I know more about how much more we might be seeing of Sophia DiMartino Sylvie. Mm hmm. And how much more history we might be getting on her character, etc, etc. If you're not going to bring back the character, at least don't ruin her. This was just a weird place to leave that character in. Because yeah, now a lot of people already are saying Sylvia is responsible for the multiversal war. Like, don't want her to be. But my question is, with what we understand, the one who remains explained. He knew everything up until that moment. He never says everything up until that moment is decided and nothing after that moment is decided. He said that he knew till then. And so he probably even knew what her answer was going to be. Like, if I ask if you want to make out, I know what your answer is going to be. But it still hasn't happened. Just because his knowledge ends does not mean that her path isn't further predetermined. Yeah, exactly. She could be responsible for this in a way that Hawkeye was responsible for stealing the Tesseract. Especially when you're talking about Lokis and Lokis who do possessions. I feel like we could find out that what set her on her path was a Kang, that a Kang manipulated everything. That's what made her different. And this was so that a Kang could start the Kang War. And it makes me think back to a lot of the reactions to Loki episode one and the idea that the TVA is the ultimate power. And like, 
They aren't and weren't. They were a power level that we hadn't dealt with yet. But that doesn't mean that street level stuff isn't important. And it doesn't mean that there isn't someone potentially even fucking higher than that. That's the problem, but also the joy of having a universe and a series and a franchise that is on this scale is that it is just so big and there are so many levels to it. And something that I need to bring up that I don't think really matters to a lot of people yet, but will matter to them greatly. Parallel between Loki and Thor Love and Thunder is tremendous in that Thor is about to be about Jane building the hammer. We all know this from the press photos. At the same time, they've also been very vocal about Christian Bale coming on as Gore the God Butcher. Yeah. And Gore the God Butcher is one of my all-time favorite Thor villains, and he represents the absolute death of life. He is empowered by something known as the All Black, which is a dark weapon created by by the god that birthed all symbiotes. So his weapon is literally the same sort of pure darkness that Venom is. Okay. But it's like an equal weapon to Thor's weapons in many ways. And I bring this up because the plot of Thor is about to be a woman steps up as Thor and is going to be in a situation where there is an end of all possibility. Loki told the story of a woman stepping up and becoming Loki, ending one man's possibilities to create a multiverse of other opportunity. There is a beautiful deconstruction in those two realities. Ragnarok is actually based on Planet Hulk, which is an incredibly dark, depressing, morbid story about loss and life and, and it's just sad and the converse of that is Ragnarok is the funniest fucking Thor movie. We're about to go into a story that is brutally dark. One of the big conceits of Jane being Thor in the comics is that she is dying of terminal cancer and every time she transforms into Thor it heals her. So becoming Thor erases her chemo. So every time she becomes Thor it kills her more. The darkness of what Love and Thunder deals with contrasted with the lightness we're expecting, I wonder if some of that tonal shift is what we have a problem with in Loki. I wonder if some of what we're dealing with is, we're talking about the TVA, this warm sense of forever and opportunity, and it's being met with short, sharp, stopping snark. That's the contrast that I'm really thinking about here. All said and done, I liked these six episodes. I loved the show more than I liked any episode, but this finale exemplified a lot of that for me. I think you make a lot of really good points about why Loki is getting the reactions that it is. I think it even connects back to something you were talking about earlier, where it felt like one through five were one narrative that even in itself was chopped up. But, you know, five felt more like the proper finale to the season. The only thing that really from episode six that it felt like that we didn't get in episode five was her killing he who remains that yeah. was you know her mission and her goal but everything else about the episode really feels almost not quite like a separate narrative but it is like like a different point yeah but it, it but but it is feeding into a larger narrative i saw a lot of reviews that were complaining that you know it should have been a loki instead of kang and who cares that because that's not part of this story and proper classical structure but that's not how the world works and i understand this is a fictional story but it also is trying to tell bigger stories than just this one i am so happy that they got away with being able to introduce this character so early being able to introduce this narrative so early being able to introduce it in something that isn't just this is the movie where we thought we were going right. to get kang it's a weird structure for them to have done it but it's sort of like how they gave mark ruffalo's hulk a narrative from Ragnarok, Infinity War, through to Endgame. And it's not a main film focal point, but it's still them trying to give a character a narrative structure through the course of several films, even when he's not the title character. And I think that's part of what they're doing here. You don't expect Kang to have showed up here, but, you know, except you also kind of did because they hinted at it the entire effing time. Yeah. One of the really cool things about this finale, though, is how it ties into the next Marvel Disney Plus project that is going to be coming out we had been saying and speculating for a while that we thought perhaps what if was going to actually end up being canon once the multiverse was unleashed and it has been confirmed by the showrunner that that is what they are doing here so uh we are very excited to start watching reviewing and covering and delving into that multiverse and buying the lego sets 
and buying the Lego sets. I get that. We saw some at Target the other day. They're beautiful. They are. And you know, it's one of those things where like, if you're going to charge 30 for a set, the fact that you've given me three minifigs per set is like, oh, thank you guys. Because I would spend $7 plus $3 of shipping to pick up those minifigs on eBay anyway. So $10 a minifig, I'm in. And it's not just that the sets are beautiful, but what they imply about what we can expect from this series is very cool, very exciting. And we are looking forward to coming at you, telling you what this guy knows uh, about where any of the what ifs and what maybes might come from the comics. You know, when I think about Stormbreaker, right, one of the things that actually sticks out to me about Stormbreaker is the fact that the vines and the roots are really a part of it. And that makes sense with Thor's iconography because Thor has the world tree they showed time resuming as branches yeah and it came out of loki and you know that's one thing you fuckers got super right i mean you got a lot right but that's one thing you guys got super duper right and i can't wait to see what if i mean i'm probably a little bit more excited to get into uh some ms marvel and some shang chi i guess eternals no the and hawkeye well we still don't have any idea of where miss marvel is going to be we thought originally she was going to come before hawkeye we now have a date for hawkeye being november 24th but no news on miss marvel i want know i wanted that first Dang well it. until then i can't wait to see what the marvel multiverse throws our way and what if yeah Hey guys, if you like that cut, do be sure to like some of our other materials. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out these other amazing videos here at X's for Podcast.